Okay, so welcome to the muscular system lesson. So as we have talked about in the past, when we talked about cells and tissue, we learned that there are three types of muscular tissue. So when we're looking at the muscular system, we first of all just need to identify those, those three types of muscular tissue. So the first one is skeletal muscular tissue. It makes sense that the skeletal muscular tissue refers to the muscles that are attached to our skeleton. So the skeletal muscles. These muscles are attached to our bones via a connective tissue called tendons. So in the skeletal lesson, we learned that ligaments attach bone to bone, and now we've got tendons attach muscle to bone. These skeletal muscles are often referred to as striped or striated. And that really refers to the way they look. If you see a diagram of muscles and even the diagram of the full body muscles that I sent you, they've got that striped or striated appearance. So just remember that, that appearance there is like a striped or striated it's referred to. And that striped or striated appearance is made up of the muscle fibres, the fibres that make up these skeletal muscles. And we've got thin muscle fibres and thick muscle fibres. Um, they both have names. So the thin muscle fibres are called actin, A-C-T-I-N fibres and the thick fibres are called myosin, M-Y-O-S-I-N, myosin. So your skeletal muscular tissue is striped or striated and it's made up of your actin and myosin muscle fibres which are thin and thick. So these, uh, this muscular tissue allows for voluntary movement. Remember, these muscles are under voluntary control. So they allow the movements um, that we are most aware of. So as I'm talking and using my hands, which I do all the time, even my mouth moving to speak, when we're walking, skipping, running, our bicep curls, our sit-ups, they're all skeletal muscular tissue movements and they are voluntary, so they are controlled consciously by the brain. So we have motor nerves that run through the muscles that allow these voluntary movements to take place. Motor, M-O-T-O-R, nerves. So these nerves run through the muscle and at the very centre of the muscle, so if we're talking about the bicep, we have a motor point and that is where the contraction of the muscle fibres takes place to initiate the movement. So the motor nerves run through those muscles, the skeletal muscles, and at the middle of that muscle we've got the motor point. And in that place is where the contraction of the muscle takes place. So these are the types of muscles that you're going to be working on with your clients, thinking about things like tension, tightness, muscle soreness, 
thinking about after exercise. So all the different conditions that you're going to be treating. Um, predominantly in massage, this is what clients are going to come to you about. Their sore shoulders, their tight lower back, their tight legs from exercising. Um, and so this is where we're finding that muscle tension and tightness. What happens when the muscle gets tight is all those muscle fibers, so all that striated or striped tissue, starts to get a little bit knotted. Um, and that's what we would refer to as our tension areas, the knots. And so those fibers, almost a little bit, so I explain it in a massage class, a bit like when you put a necklace into a jewelry box and you don't really know how, like you didn't do anything with it, but when you took it back out again a month later, it was all knotted up, all that chain was all knotted up. Um, and so I want you to imagine that's sort of what happens to those muscle fibres. We hold ourselves in weird positions, we sleep strangely, we carry a heavy bag or a toddler on our hip. And so our muscles start to get tight and I want you to imagine those fibres have got sort of tangled up with each other. And when you get a necklace out of your jewellery box, it's really difficult to unpick it because it's tiny little, you know, areas of chain. And so sometimes what we then do is you sort of rub it in your hands a little bit to try and warm it and you find that the areas of the chain start to come undone a little bit as you sort of manipulate it in your fingers. That's what your massage is effectively doing to those muscle fibres. Um, as you're massaging and warming those muscle fibres, they start to untangle and loosen. So you can now start to visualise what effect your massage is specifically having on the muscles. Muscles will then contribute to postural faults. So as we talked about different activities that we're doing throughout the day or different responsibilities we're putting on our muscles like heavy bags, sitting in a car, um, it can contribute to postural faults where some of our muscles are uh, tighter or we lengthen muscles. Um, we'll talk about postural faults a little bit more in a moment. So first type of muscular tissue, skeletal muscular tissue. It is voluntary. The muscles are made up of actin and myosin fibers, which give a striped or striated appearance to the muscle. These muscles are responsible for our skeleton to be able to move. So the muscles are attached to our skeleton via tendons. And the motor nerves that run through the muscle enable a contraction to happen. So our um, limbs and our body parts are able to move under conscious control. These muscles get tight and tense and that is as massage therapists what you are treating. Okay, second type of muscular tissue. Again, we talked about this in cells and tissue. We've got visceral. Remember, it's spelt viscural. So whereas we said that the skeletal muscular tissue is striped or striated, it has like a, a non, an unsmooth finish. Our visceral muscular tissue is known as smooth. And if you recall, it is involuntary, so it's not under conscious control. And it works um, areas inside the body, so organs of the body. So digestion, once we've swallowed food or water, we don't then have to think about it moving through the digestive system or the urinary system because those muscles become visceral muscular tissue. So it's not under conscious control. It is involuntary and those muscles are known as smooth. The action that moves your food and water through your digestive system is like a rippling movement and that's called peristalsis. And our last and final type of muscular tissue is our cardiac muscular tissue. It's exclusive to the heart and luckily it is involuntary as well. So it's responsible for that beating action, that pulsing action of the heart.
So when we are doing a massage or a treatment on a client, we effectively are treating all three types of muscular tissue. So on the you know, basis of it, of course, when you're doing a back massage, you're mainly treating the skeletal muscular tissue, the clients coming in for those issues. Um, and that's what you want to focus your attention on to make sure that you relieve any uh, tension or muscular issues that they've got. However, we're massaging, we're going to have an effect on digestion. So the fact that we're massaging the body, we're increasing blood circulation, we're going to make digestion far more efficient um, or effective. So we are having an effect on the visceral muscular tissue, not directly, but indirectly, particularly if we're massaging the abdomen because we're directly over those organs. So we're gonna increase um, that digestive action, which is why after a body massage, we wouldn't want a client to go away straight away and eat a heavy meal. Because we've just you know, brought all the blood to that area, we don't want it to be overstimulated by something heavy going into their digestive system straight away. We're definitely gonna increase the urinary system because everybody straight away after a massage needs a wee. Um, possibly as well because we've increased the lymphatic system so we're getting rid of toxins but ultimately again we would have brought blood to the kidneys the ureters the bladder and the urethra um, to stimulate removal of those toxins and we are having effect on cardiac muscular tissue as well when we treat a client for a relaxing treatment we slow the heart rate we lower blood pressure um, and so again, inadvertently, we're having an effect on that cardiac muscular tissue by slowing down the heart rate, lowering blood pressure. So on the surface, you'd think, oh, I'm just treating, you know, the trapezius or the bicep or the tricep, but think deeper, your massage is having a whole body effect. Or even your pedicure is having a whole body effect. It doesn't need to be a full body massage. So then we want to think about these skeletal muscles. So that's predominantly what we are going to be treating in our treatments. And so we need to think about how these muscles work um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and these muscles work on an exercise basis. So even if we're not particularly thinking that we're exercising, just the movement of muscles is exercising those, um, those muscles in the area that you're working. And there are two forms of exercising our muscles. One is aerobic and one is called anaerobic. So two forms of exercise, aerobic and anaerobic. And very basically, aerobic means with oxygen and anaerobic means without oxygen or oxygen debt it's called so when let's give an example so let's say you come out of your house you're off to catch the bus and in the corner of your eyes so the bus stop's not very far away about 200, 250 meters. Um, we see the bus out of the corner of our eye coming past, but it's got a few corners to go around, but we need to think, oh yeah, you know, I need to get to the bus stop, but it's not a massive rush, but I need to make sure I'm there. You might pick up your pace a little bit, um, and by the time you get to the bus stop, you might be a little bit out of breath, your heart rate has increased, um, but you have worked aerobically. So your muscles have been able to provide that action, get you to that location, but still working with enough oxygen. So you have still been able to intake enough oxygen to fuel those muscles along with your glycogen, um, which is your sugar store, um, to get you to the bus stop in time to get the bus. The next day, however, we took a little bit longer getting ready. Um, and as we exit the house, we see the bus is pulling up at the bus stop. So we have to put our foot down and really run to get this bus. When we get there, we're quite out of breath. We're really puffing and panting. And our legs, once we sit on the bus, might feel a little bit shaky. 
At this point, we were working anaerobically. So we started to work without oxygen. Now the muscles can do this for a period of time, but as we build up an oxygen debt, um, the muscles start to produce a waste product. This waste product is called lactic acid, which when you then sat on the bus and your legs felt all shaky, um, your muscles got fatigued. And so this buildup of lactic acid begins. And if you hadn't heard of lactic acid before, you will now know because the next day you might find that your legs were a bit achy when you got out of bed um, or your hips in around your hips where you were really striding to run for that bus. Lactic acid gives you that delayed onset of muscular soreness. So if you hear the gym bunnies talk about DOMS, that's delayed onset muscular soreness. And it's a buildup of lactic acid that causes that. So that could be a, a group of clients that you're treating or a reason that you're treating a client. They could be training um, consistently, gym work or cardio work. They might be using massage um, to help them train for an event, like a one-off. Um, and so what your massage would be good to do is to release that lactic acid. So our massage would be warming the muscles, helping the lactic acid to be released and drained away. Um, and so if you had soreness in your muscles, you had a leg massage, your muscles would feel much lighter afterwards. We'd be draining that lactic acid into the lymphatic system to be removed via our urine. So our muscles have the capability of working aerobically and anaerobically, so with oxygen or without oxygen. When we start to work without oxygen or we get an oxygen debt, we have a byproduct or a waste product of exercise of la called lactic acid, which builds up in muscles and um, gives them that sore, fatigued feeling. So when we look at the functions of the muscular system, we have five main functions. The first function is that our, um, the tone of our muscles um, will determine the shape of the body. So we talked a bit about that in the skeletal system, that obviously our skeleton um, predicts the length of our limbs and our height our muscles then attached to that will define the shape of our body or give definition of shape. And that is determined by muscle tone. So again, as massage therapists, you will be aware of the tone in the muscle and how good the muscle tone is. A really good example um, to think about, or even just to sort of Google, is definition of arms, particularly women, um, arms is quite a difficult area to get definition in. Our hormones dictate that our biceps and particularly our triceps are very difficult to train. Um, and so if you think about the structure of your own arm, that's very much depicted by your bicep and your tricep and the tone that is in that muscle. Then look at a, you know, a female bodybuilder and their arms will look very different um, because their muscles are different. So your, the shape of your body is very much dependent on your muscles and then the tone that is in those muscles. So first function, shape. Second function is posture. So our muscles are responsible for maintaining an upright position. We can, which we'll look at in a moment, have faults in that though. So there's things that we will do to our bodies, there's things that we will unteach ourselves um, or unlearn that will cause postural faults. Um, and that is then sometimes due to the skeletal system, but mostly due to the muscular system, which we'll look at in a moment. So number two function or second function is posture. 
the muscles are responsible for maintaining um, the body in an upright position. Number three, and probably most obvious, the muscular system is responsible for movement. So the third function is movement. Voluntary and involuntary. So we've got one type of muscular tissue that's voluntary, those muscles that are attached to your skeleton, and the two types that are involuntary, your visceral and your cardiac. So this movement comes from these motor nerves and these nerves originate from your spinal cord. So your brain and your spinal cord form your central nervous system. Coming off from your spinal cord, we've got what we call peripheral nerves. Don't worry too much about these words because this is a bit more about the nervous system. But I just want you to understand that you've got brain and spinal cord, central nervous system. And then coming off from that, feeding the arms, the legs, the thorax, we've got these peripheral nerves. Um, and they feed, like I say, the thorax, the arms, the legs with nerves. And some of those nerves will um, create movement. I just want you to know that there are 31 pairs of nerves that come away from the spinal cord. So 31 pairs that branch off from the spinal cord to feed the rest of the body with a nerve supply. The longest nerve that comes from the spinal cord is the sciatic nerve. Spelt S-C-I-A-T-I-C, -I -I sciatic, sciatic nerve. Now, you probably didn't know that that was the longest nerve in the body, but you probably all have heard of the sciatic nerve. It branches from the lower back all the way down each leg. And it's a nerve that people have loads of issues with. But if you think about it, it runs through really big muscles. So you've got your sciatic nerve running through your lower back, your glute muscles in your buttocks, your quads and your hamstrings of the upper leg, big, big bulky muscles, and then through your lower leg muscles as well, your calf muscles, gastrocnemius, we'll go through those names in a minute. And so what happens is anywhere where muscle tightness occurs, so let's say I've done a squat challenge and I've just randomly off the cuff done 200 squats today. Well, my bottom muscles are going to be tight after that. And if they're tight to the effect that one of them is like pressing, so that sciatic nerve is running through the muscle and then that muscle's got tight and it's pressing against that nerve, that's what's going to cause me that pain, which we would refer to as sciatica. But that pain might be anywhere up or down from my lower back to the base of, my, of each of my legs. So the, the nerve might be being pressed in my lower back, but it's causing pain in my leg, or it's causing pain in my ankle or my knee. Because that nerve is so long, any pressure anywhere along it could cause pain in that area or anywhere up above it or below it. So sciatica is really difficult to treat because it could be tension in loads of different muscles but the pain might be felt in a different area, but it will always be somewhere along that line. So it will always be lower back to the base of the leg. So sciatica is something as massage therapists we treat an awful lot. And so the best form of massage for sciatica would be definitely back massage, focusing on the lower back, but then back of leg and front of leg massage. So 31 pairs of spinal nerves coming off from the spinal cord that's feeding the rest of the body, aiding with movement. The sciatic nerve is the longest nerve. Okay, function number four, production. Our muscles produce heat as they move. So the more we move around, the more heat we generate. 
And that's really crucial in one situation. So those of you who've done the integumentary system with me, the skin, we talked about what our skin does when we're hot and cold. But there's something else that our body does when we get cold. Um, so our little erector pili muscles contracted, so the hairs, all the hairs on our skin stood on end. But we also shiver. So our muscles go into a bit of an involuntary, so there must be a bit of a reflex action going on there. I might research that for you, actually. So we go into a bit of shiver. And that shiver keeps our muscles moving. And as our muscles move, they generate heat. So it's a form of protection for the body in trying to keep us warm. So muscles produce heat as they move. And a really crucial time that that happens is when we're cold and we shiver. And our last function of the muscular system is storage. Our muscles store glycogen. G-L-Y-C-O-G-E-N. Glycogen is the end product of carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates we have in our diet once they're broken down, they are stored in the muscles as glycogen. Glycogen is used for energy. So the glycogen stored in the muscle cells is then used as we work our muscles. We also have a store of glycogen in the liver. So for when our glycogen has run out in our skeletal muscles, we have a store in our liver. I think it's something like 90 minutes of exercise we have stored in our liver. So that's why if you are exercising for longer than 90 minutes, you would need some sort of supplement. So um, people that run marathons or longer distances than that, that are going to be clearly running for longer than 90 minutes, they will use um, carbohydrate gels or um, like blocks of, it's almost a bit like jelly. So it'll be very, very high carbohydrate um, contained in the gels. Um, and that will give them a sudden burst of sugar, which the muscles will, obviously once it's broken down in the body, will convert into glycogen and used for energy. When people, uh, this is like an offshoot of information, but you know what I'm like. Um, when people say they hit the wall, so when they're exercising and they hit that wall and everything in their body will tell them that they need to stop, that is when their glycogen levels have run out. So their body is saying, this isn't good, we are in like a panic situation. And so it will make your body feel like it's going to die. But also your body is very good at protecting itself. And so it will start to tell your brain that you're going to also die and that it's absolutely fine for you to stop. And you'll think of all the good, really, really fantastic reasons why you shouldn't continue to put one foot in front of the other or swim or do whatever activity you're doing. That actually, people then say if they get past the wall, they actually feel really good afterwards. And that is where your energy, the energy that you're using is convert, your body is converting from using sugar or glycogen because it's been used up into fat. So you've got two sources of energy in your body, um, sugar and fat. And 99% of people, 99% of the time, will constantly be working on sugar as a source of energy. But we do have a second source, which is fat. And so that period of time where your body's run out of sugar and it's panicking, but then obviously it's got another storage, but it doesn't want to use that, um, is that wall that people hit. If they get past that, their body starts utilising fat and they get that good feeling again because they have an energy source. But there's a significant period of time where there's no energy source. Unless they're using their gels or things to tide them over. Little snippet of information. So five functions of the, of the muscular system. Shape, 
posture, movement, production and storage. So let's look at those postural faults. So these are faults that you need to become familiar with because all of you as massage or therapists in other areas are going to see this or become aware of it with your clients. So when we are babies and children and we're learning to walk and lift things up and bend down, we do it beautifully. We bend down using our knees and we keep our back straight. Um, but somewhere along the line, life takes over and we start to do things um, incorrectly and we start to then gain postural faults as a result. Postural faults occur when we do a movement or a position in our body for a, length, for a lengthy amount of time and then the muscles start to work wrongly almost. So there's three main postural faults. The first one is called kyphosis. I'll spell it K-Y-P-H-O-S-I-S. -S. So kyphosis is rounding of the shoulders or like a humped back appearance. Really, really common postural fault. We've all forgotten really how to sit and stand. But there will be things that are in our lives that have affected that. So heavy bags, sitting, driving in a car, um, or even sitting at a desk at a computer if we haven't had the correct like uh, desk and chair height. But also sort of laziness as well, of just sort of slouching rather than sitting up straight. So if you can visualize kyphosis, it's like a hunched appearance. Now what's happened, so when people have that postural fault, actually it's really hard to sit normally or to stand normally. What's happened is the muscles that sit here have shortened. So they've got used to sitting shorter and your trapezius across your shoulders has lengthened. So it's got used to sitting longer. So actually when I then do that, it hurts because this muscle's like, no, hang on a second. I'm used to being this short and now you're stretching me. So how massage can help that is to release the tension that's caused in those muscles from that bad posture. It re-educates the muscles to sit where we want them to. It relaxes the client so they're perhaps not hunched up with their shoulders up around their ears from being tense and tight, but also makes the client more mindful of their posture, the muscles that are contributing to that posture, um, and so sort of educates the client. We could also think about some postural exercises that we could recommend to our clients to do if they suffered with rounded shoulders. Best thing is to counteract the movement that's happening. So when they've got rounded shoulders, shoulders coming forward. So I would recommend to anybody with tension in that area to do some really big backwards arm circles or backward shoulder rolls counteract the movement. Also they could hold their arms behind their back and pull their shoulder blades together. Really nice to give your clients postural exercises. Um, it's something nice they can take away with them to do in between their treatments. So kyphosis, rounded shoulders. Our next one is lordosis. L-O-R-D-O-S-I-S. I'm going to stand up for this one, but you might not be able to see it. Anywhere. So lordosis, it refers to the lumbar region of our spine, so lower back. And it's where we have an inward curve to our lumbar spine. So we're almost sticking our bottoms out and really making a very markedly inward curve of our lumbar region. Now, this is quite a common posture or more common postural fault at the moment because a very peachy bottom is sort of what everybody's wanting. So people are almost stood with their lower back in and their bottoms protruding to give this appearance of a more peachy bottom. Um, so lordosis is a, is a much more common postural fault than it was before, just through sort of fashion. So an inward curve of that lumbar region, protruding bottom, 
really markedly inward curve. Um, really good exercise for this is on all fours and is it angry cat, happy cow? It's a yoga pose. So you sort of pull your tummy in and really um, sort of protrude your back. I think that's angry cat. And then you go the other way where you sort of lift your head and you lift your bottom and you sink your lower back in, which I think is happy cow. Angry cat, happy cow. So that's a good exercise that clients could do at home. I tell you what else, uh, child's pose would be really good. So hands stretched out in front of you, sitting back onto your heels. That's a really nice. Um, that's nice for all postural faults, really. And lastly, we've got scoliosis. S C O L I O. S I S scoliosis. This might be one that you've heard of. Um, scoliosis can occur, um, it can be hereditary, and there's lots of amazing surgeries that people can have now um, for scoliosis. Or it can be through postural complaints. Scoliosis, I want you to remember, it's like an S shape in the spine. So it's sort of looking, it's coming out to the side rather than forward or back arches it's to the side. So remember, scoliosis starts with an S and it's an S-shaped spine. So obviously if it's hereditary, it's within their genetic material for that to have occurred, that fault to have occurred in their spine. If it's not hereditary, it's usually caused by things like heavy bags um, or carrying something on your hip. Um, so children is an obvious uh, cause of that particularly because we would tend to carry them on one hip. And if you've had lots and lots of children, one after another, um, your body, again, I'm just going to stand up. You're sort of on the wonk like that. So it's quite extensive, but it can cause a limp in people because um, it can cause one foot to be higher than the other because you've altered the level of your hip. Uh, good postural exercises would be sort of rotations, so with a hoop or just a rotation generally. Um, they could do movements with like a side plank. Um, or even like opposite toe touches would be good. It's great to Google, have a look at, if you Google postural exercises for each of those, you'll come up with loads. It's great to offer them to clients. So that's great because we can offer advice, but if you think about it, those muscles, if they've got a bit of a postural complaint, there's gonna be tightness in the muscles. And so you want to be thinking about where do I need to focus my work on? So if they struggle with rounded shoulders or tension in the top of the back, that's where it's going to show itself. Kyphosis is going to be tightness in all of this area, really leading down to bra strap area, so mid thoracic region. Lordosis, they're gonna have much more tightness and tension in the lower back and the hips. And scoliosis, well generally all of their back because it's going to be on, off, on one side on one side and the other side, the other side, because it's going to be an S shape. So you're going to find the areas around their spine, their shoulders, their lower back, um, even into their hips and their glutes are going to be tighter. And so obviously you find tightness in an area, you want to work a little bit longer in that area. So you're either going to find that as a therapist or they're going to tell you about that tightness that they're experiencing um, when they come in for their treatments. So three postural faults, kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. In each of your classes, as you're doing massage, you will talk about those in a little bit more detail, and you will be asked to do a piece of work that relates to looking at exercises that you can talk to your clients about. For those of you doing Indian head massage, I'm gonna put that on the group and body massage for Connor. Because actually after today, you're going to know the names of the muscles. And so um, you'll be able to link the names of the muscles and the exercises.
Okay, so now if you have a look at your diagrams, we are going to talk about the names of the muscles and some of their actions. So you have got a jolly fellow front of the body muscles there. Okay, so number one, last week we talked about the, the bone of the forehead um, and we've got a muscle that sits over that. And actually this is really easy to remember because our bone was the frontal bone and our muscle is the frontalis. Number two is a muscle that surrounds our eye. So it's a ring shaped muscle that surrounds each of the eyes. This muscle is called the orbicularis oculi. I'm going to spell it. O-R-B-I-C-U-L-A-R-I-S. New word, oculi, O double C. U-L-I. Number three, we've got a quite a big muscle at the edge of our cheek here. It's called the masseter. M-A-S-S-E-T-E-R. Okay, we're coming down into the neck number four. We've got two big muscles. These hold a lot of tension for you, Indian head massage, body massage, ladies, facial, ladies, here. Big, big muscles. Think of Deirdre Barlow. And she did that, and they would come out at the side. This is called your sternoclidomastoid. Woo! So, sterno, S T E R N O. Clido, C L E I D O, mastoid, M A S T O I D, sterno clido mastoid. Oh, I love that muscle. You can sound super intelligent when you talk about that one. Number five, we've got a muscle that runs down the length of our neck here, it's responsible for our double chins. It's called the platysma, P-L-A-T-Y-S-M-A, -A, platysma. Okay, number six, we're gonna go back over these because you've got a facial diagram as well. Um, so number six is a ring-shaped muscle around your mouth. This is called the orbicularis oris. So orbicularis spelt the same as when it was around the eye. And then oris, O-R-I-S. And then number seven, got a muscle that sits between the eyebrows here. It's responsible for our um, vertical frown lines. I'll just iron those back out again. Um, and it's called the corrugator. C-O-R-R-U-G-A-T-O-R, corrugator. So there's a few facial muscles there. We're gonna come back and label more facial muscles uh, later. It's hard to put them all on him. So now we're gonna work our way around the body. So A refers to two big muscles here. They're called the pectoral muscles. They are responsible for bringing the arms towards the body. So adducting, A-D-D, -D, adducting.
And also a little bit of rotation of the arm as well, the pectoral is responsible for. You'll feel that muscle engage as you rotate your arm. So as I've just talked about adducting, I just want to, before we go on to other muscles, just talk about the word adduct. So our muscles, some of our muscles have the ability to adduct and some have the ability to abduct. So two words, adduct, A-D-D, -D, refers to bringing towards the body. And abduct means to take away from the body. So in the gym, uh, there's two machines for your legs. One where you bring your legs in, and that's the hard work. That's an adductor. And one where you take your legs away from your body, and that's the hard work, and that's called an abductor. And remember it as if you were to abduct somebody, you're taking them away. So the movement away from the body is to abduct. The movement towards the body is to adduct. So your pectoral muscles are responsible for adducting or adaptation of your arm. B refers to the rectus abdominis. These are responsible for flexing the trunk, so bringing your body up. If we want to work those muscles, we do a sit-up. So it's flexing your trunk, bringing the trunk of your body up. C, we're coming to the side of the body, our waist muscles. These are called the obliques. O-B-L-I-Q-U-E-S. And they enable our trunk, the mid part of our body, to move from side to side. Okay, moving down onto the legs. So D refers to a strip of muscle that sits on the outside of the leg. And it's called the abductor. T-O-R at the end, abductor. And its name is what it does. So it takes, so when you work that gym machine, when you take your legs out, you're working your abductors. So it moves the leg outwards. Coming to E is the front of the thigh. This is where our quadriceps are. Quad recepts. There's four of them, very big bulky muscle. Remember your sciatic nerve runs through them. So any tension in your quads could result in sciatic pain. Your quadriceps are responsible for extending your knee. So when your um, leg is bent, pulling your knee forward and flexing your hip. When we're in class, I will demonstrate all of these. You just can't see my legs on this. So don't worry, I'll be showing you all of these. So quadriceps, extend the knee, flex the hip. Okay, working up the other side of your diagram. So F is the outer portion of your lower leg. So it's on the little toe side. So when you feel your leg, you wouldn't actually think there's a muscle there, but it's a very thin, tight piece of muscle. Um, and it's called the tibialis anterior. I'm gonna spell it T-I-B-I-A-L-I-S, tibialis anterior, A-N-T-E-R-I-O-R. -E tibialis anterior. And it enables us to flex our foot, so to draw our toes upwards. So if you flex your foot now, you'll feel that that muscle on the outer side of your lower leg goes harder. You can feel it pulling up. Mine just cracked. That's probably not a good sign. <laughs> 
Okay, coming up, letter G is pointing to the inner portion of the thigh. Um, and these are the adductor muscles. So as we had for D, abductor, these are the adductors, A-D-D. -D. And they do the opposite movement of um, being responsible for moving the legs inwards. Okay, coming higher up, H is pointing to something that we can't actually see, that's not particularly on the diagram, but we've got uh, ribs as part of our uh, skeletal system. We've got our ribs and our ribs need to be able to move slightly to accommodate the, in, um, the inflation of our lungs. And so in between each of our ribs, we have a little muscle that's very small and it only enables a very small action, but enables the movement of the rib cage out and in. These little muscles are called intercostals. And they're responsible for raising and lowering the rib cage. Intercostals. So if you were asked about breathing muscles or muscles that aid breathing, your intercostals would be one of them. If you want to put a little side note, there's another muscle that you can't see on this diagram that is responsible for breathing. And it's like a dome shaped muscle. So it would sit a little bit like that underneath the lungs and it's called the diaphragm. You've probably all heard of it. So it's a dome shaped. When we breathe in, that dome flattens to allow the lungs the capacity to fill to the base. So actually all of our digestive organs get pushed out because that dome flattens. And then as we breathe out, the dome pushes back up again. So if you're talking about muscles responsible for breathing or muscles that aid breathing, you've got your diaphragm and your intercostals. Okay, coming up a little bit higher, we've got I, which is the front of our model's arm. That's his bicep. Your bicep allows your lower arm to flex. Think of a bicep curl. It's responsible for bringing the arm in. And lastly, J, we've got a little shoulder pad shaped muscle. So shoulder muscle, which is called the deltoid. D-E-L-T-O-I-D. -E it's responsible for lifting the arm. Okay, so if you now come to the back of the body, we'll label the muscles that we couldn't see on the front. So we'll start on the right hand side of the body. We've got a very big triangular muscle. So this muscle stems all of that area there. So it comes up, down and in. You can see it outlined. So it's a triangular muscle, number one. It's called the trapezius. T-R-A-P-E-Z-I-U-S. Lots of tension held here. This is a muscle for you massage therapists. This is what you are going to be working on. Probably what you want working on right now. <laughs> So it's responsible for lifting and lowering the shoulders. So think about when people get tension and tightness, their shoulders work their way up towards their ears. If they're already hunching over as well, they're causing tension in that area. So trapezius is a major, major muscle for um, tension and tightness. 
Okay, number two, so branching off from the, um, the trapezius, we've got two muscles either side, lower back muscles or mid to lower back muscles. Again, hold a lot of tension and tightness. These are called the latissimus dorsi. L-A-T-I-S-S-I-M-U-S. Latissimus and then dorsi, D-O-R-S-I. Lots of movements happen here. They're quite st stabilizing muscles. If you think our arms and our legs wave around all over the place, those latissimus dorsi muscles will often just protect posture, keep the body upright while we're doing these other movements. Remember where that muscle is. Um, think about a whale has a dorsal fin on its lower back. So latissimus dorsi might help you remember. And then we've got another muscle that sits. So this is number three, but it actually sits all the way underneath the vertebrae of the spine. And it's called the erector spinae. E-R-E-C-T-O-R, -E erector, and then spinae, S-P-I-N-A-E. It's deep, this muscle, and it's quite a thin strip of muscle that sits below the vertebrae or around the vertebrae. Um, when we, so if you've had back massage before, or those of you who've learned massage, when you're doing your thumb circles up either side of the spine, you are working the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi, but you want to be focusing your thoughts on that erector spinae. It's responsible for keeping the spine upright, hence its name. Holds a lot of tension. Okay, number four. So coming down the body, we've got the muscles of the buttocks, which are the gluteals. G-L-U-T-E-A-L-S. They help with the rotation in the hip, a bit of um, abduction, so taking away from the body. Number five, we've got three muscles in the back of our upper leg called the hamstrings. If you think about the movement the hamstrings are going to do, they're going to do the opposite to the quadriceps because they're in the opposite, they're in opposing areas. So whereas the quadriceps help the knee to extend and come back again, or to extend, we work to the quadricep, as we bring the leg back again, it will be the hamstrings that work. So that would be, um, oh, so I'm looking at the wrong one flexing the leg so rather than extending the leg it's flexing the leg and extending the thigh if, if you could see my legs oh you're going to see a bit of my messy kitchen table so the, the quads will work when my leg does that Oh, my slipper as well. There we go. Good job I put black leggings on, isn't it? And not my pyjama bottoms. <laughs> so as my leg comes up, it's my quads working. As my leg comes back down, it's my hamstrings working. As I draw in my hip up, it's my quads working. As I bring my hip back down, it's my hamstrings working. Posing muscles can't work at the same time. So your quads and your hamstrings cannot work at the same time because they are opposing muscles. Your bicep and your tricep can't work at the same time because you can't do that movement and that movement at the same time because they're opposing. So opposite muscles can't work at the same time. Okay, coming down. From the hamstrings, we've got the lower leg, the back of the lower leg, big bulky muscle in your calf. 
is called the gastrocnemius. G-A-S-T-R-O-C-N-E-M-E-U-S. Gastrocnemius. Um, helps you to point your toes. So whereas our front of the leg muscle, the tibialis anterior, enabled us to point our toes up to the sky, our gastrocnemius works when we point our toes. So this muscle is really affected by high heels because your toe is almost always pointed. So you get very tight um, gastrocnemius muscles from wearing high heels. And then there's a little helper muscle at the back of the leg. So this is a much smaller muscle than your gastrocnemius. Um, it aids the movement of the gastrocnemius. And it's called the soleus, S-O-L-E-U-S. So it's a little helper muscle. And then coming higher up the body, we've got the back of the arm, opposing muscle to the bicep. This is the tricep. There are three of them in each arm. And then lastly, the back of the head, we talked about this bone last week, it's called the occipital bone. The muscle is the occipitalis. Like the frontal bone had the frontalis, we've got the occipital bone has the occipitalis. O-C-C, I-P-I-T-A-L-I-S. It's responsible for drawing the head backwards. I don't think I said what the tricep did, but obviously the bicep pulls the arm in, um, so flexes the arm, the tricep extends the arm at the elbow. Okay, I'll come back to that if you've got any questions about spellings or anything. Let's go and just very quickly have a look at your facial muscle diagram. So we've already labelled some of these on our original model. So A is pointing to the forehead muscle, so that was the frontalis. Your frontalis is responsible for raising your eyebrows, so also for your horizontal lines. So raising your brows. A is the frontalis. B is the muscle that covers this area here. Remember the bone was called the temporal, so the muscle is the temporalis. Your temporalis muscle is actually one of your chewing muscles. It helps to retract your jaw. So it's quite far away. But if when, next time you eat, if you put your finger on your temple, you'll feel that muscle working. You can see it on people as well. Once you start to see it though, you can't unsee it. So it can get a little bit irritating. <laughs> so temporalis um, is a chewing muscle. C, we already labelled this on our first diagram. This is your orbicularis oculi. This muscle is responsible for blinking. So it closes your eyelids. Remember, it's a circular shaped muscle all the way around the eye. So in facials, when we're doing our little eye circle massage movements, we're working the orbicularis oculi, responsible for your crow's feet, aging lines. D, we labelled this big muscle, sits about here on the face. It's the masseter. That's your second muscle that's responsible for chewing. Uh, this muscle gets really tight on people who get stressed and clench their teeth. 
So you'll often find Indian head massage. We come into this area and we work when we do the face. Um, and you'll often find this area is really tight. People that hold their jaw tightly. So then E refers to a little muscle that we have that sort of sits horizontally in here. <clears throat> it's called the buccinator. B U -C, C I N A T O R. It's responsible for being able to puff the cheeks in and out. So blowing them out and sucking them in. And you can see. So sucking and blowing. <clears throat> F we have already labeled on our other model. It's that platysma that muscle that sits down the center of the neck. So it's responsible for our double chin, but it's also um, the muscle we use to yawn. So it pulls your mandible, that bone, downwards. That's your platysma. So yawning, Um, and then branching off from the platysma, we've got a muscle that sits over the center panel of our chin. This is called the mentalis. Mental with an I-S on the end, mentalis. This helps to raise the lower lip. Or like raspberry your chin. This is going to be a really attractive video to watch back, isn't it? I've just realised. <laughs> H. We've already labelled this on our first model. The ring of the ring muscle around the mouth, orbicularis oris. It's our kissing muscle. It allows us to purse our lips together. And lastly, we've got the muscle that sits across the cheekbone. Now, if you remember, the cheekbone is called the zygomatic bone. So our muscle across there is the zygomaticus. Z Y G O M A T I C U S, zygomaticus. Um, and this lifts. So when people smile, you really see their cheekbones. That's why it's lifting the mouth, lifting the cheeks. So smiling and laughing. So you will need to know the names of those muscles and you will need to know their actions. But as you learn those muscles, if a test paper said to you, what muscle draws the arm in towards the body? Do the movement, feel which muscle it was. That's my pectoral muscles. Which movement brings the lower arm up or flexes the lower arm? Do the movement. Oh yeah, that's my bicep. So, a lot of these words can get very confusing with saying these draw, we didn't do J, did we? Sorry, J, corrugator. We labeled it on your original model. Do you know I was gonna use that as the next example? That's how I realized I hadn't <laughs> filled it out. So it's the corrugator in between the brows and it draws the eyebrows together. So it was those vertical frown lines drawing the eyebrows in towards each other. So if your test paper said which muscle is responsible for drawing the eyebrows into each other, do it and think, oh yeah, of course, it's that muscle. You can feel it's contracted. You can feel it's shortened. 
So you can learn it as words or you could learn it as imagining that area. You know, you've all got these muscles, so you can now be imagining the movements that they're performing. And now you can map out the body, looking at those muscles. You can now know that when you're massaging the back or the upper arms, the legs, you can be visualizing which muscles you're working on, what those muscles are responsible for, why they might feel tight, um, and then you can aid that tightness and tension but you could then be explaining to the client why they might be feeling what they're feeling so you're learning this for the sake of being able to transfer that knowledge into your treatments it's not just a biology lesson it's about linking all of this so those of you doing Indian head massage you now know about these muscles which you're not going to come into contact with but now when you're doing the back, you're thinking, my goodness, I'm working on that erector spinae, I'm working on the trapezius, perhaps a tiny bit of latissimus dorsi. And then when I come into the neck, I'm doing the sternocleidomastoid and the occipitalis. And as I'm working the shoulders, I'm doing the deltoid and the tricep and the bicep. If you have already done the arm massage, you'll know now you work down the arms using your thumbs, working the bicep. And then you work with your fingers behind the arm, working the tricep. So now there's going to be rhyme to the reason or reason to the rhyme of why you were doing some of the things you were doing, why you were utilizing fingers or thumbs, because they were working a specific muscle group. So hopefully it starts to bring your treatments all together, not just learning the treatment and then the biology, but linking it together. So very quickly to recap, um, muscular system. So we've obviously labelled all of those muscles and you can start to be thinking about linking those muscles to your treatments. Three types of muscular tissue. Our skeletal muscular tissue, which is voluntary. Those are the muscles we just labelled. They're often referred to as striped or tri striated and they have both thin and thick muscle fibres, which are called actin. Actin sounds like thin, actin, thin, myosin, thick. These are attached to our bones via tendons and they allow our skeleton to move. We have nerves that run through these muscles, motor nerves that allow movement to occur and a contraction takes place at the motor point, which is the middle of the muscle. These are muscles which get tight and tense and they can cause or um, have issues as a result of postural faults. We then have muscular, uh, sorry, visceral muscular tissue, which is our smooth muscular tissue. It's involuntary and use, is worked um, through the digestive, the urinary system. Remember that movement, peristalsis, that rippling movement. And lastly, we have the cardiac muscular tissue, which is exclusive to the heart and is responsible for the heart contracting and relaxing, being able to pump the blood around the body. Our muscles are able to work in two different ways, aerobically with oxygen. Remember getting to the bus, little bit of a jog to get there, but it was okay. Muscles are still working with oxygen but then they can also work anaerobically. So when oxygen runs out, there's not enough source of oxygen. Uh, when that happens, our muscles start to produce lactic acid, which is a waste or a byproduct of exercise and causes muscle fatigue and muscle soreness. Our muscular system has five functions, shape. So muscle tone will depict a certain amount of the shape of our body. Posture, our muscular system is responsible for maintaining an upright position. Movement, our muscular system is responsible for both voluntary and involuntary movement. Our voluntary movement is used by our skeletal muscular tissue. Remember we've got those 31 pairs of nerves that branch out from the spine and initiate movement in our arms, legs, trunk, the longest nerve of that is the sciatic nerve from lower back down each leg. Number four, production. Our muscles produce heat. Remember that shivering is necessity for trying to keep the body warm under colder temperatures. 
And our last function is storage. Our muscles are able to store glycogen, which is a byproduct of or an end product of carbohydrates. And the glycogen is what gives our muscles energy. Sometimes our muscles can work against us and different positions um, that we have been in can cause us to have postural faults. Kyphosis is rounding of the shoulders. Lordosis is an inward curve of the lumbar region of the spine, a markedly inward. There is a natural inward curve, more so. Remember a sticky out bottom. And scoliosis, which is that S-shaped curve. The muscles that surround those areas will be impacted as a result. And so your massage will be adapted according to that, but also your aftercare advice can be adapted to include yoga or postural exercises that will help to counteract the fault. And then you've got a lot of muscles to then learn on your diagrams that we've labeled. When you're massaging, as you're thinking about the movement, start to think about what muscle am I working? You need to maintain, need to get that knowledge and then maintain it. And it's visible, like we said about the skeletal system, it's much easier than cells. I can think, right, as I'm hacking and cupping and pounding and beating on those leg muscles, what am I working? Why could they be uncomfortable? What muscles are they attached to that, are, um, that could also be, um, have tension in them or be causing the client issues. So start to visualize the muscles, start to remember what they're called. In your classes, whether you're with me or one of the other teachers, as you're working those muscles now, we will start to say, what muscle are you working? Or this is the quadricep muscles. How many are there? What are they attached to, etc. So we'll start to be drawing that knowledge from you and reinforcing it. So that is an overview then of the muscular system.